Chapter Twenty Four of the Alps, the Danube, and the Near East. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Betty B. The Kings of Greece. Kings are like stars; they rise and set. They have the worship of the world, but no repose. These words of Shelley fit well the kings of Greece, and especially George the Second, with whom I had a talk while he was a star in the imperial constellation of Europe. Today by an act of parliament confirmed by vote of the people greece is a republic and george has been banished after a brief reign he is living with his celebrated mother-in-law queen marie of roumania the star of george the second rose on september twenty seventh nineteen twenty two when he succeeded to the throne on the forced abdication of his father constantino the first who was elected after the assassination of his father george the first his star is now behind the clouds but whether it has really set remains for the politicians to decide in greece revolutions spring up like mushrooms and another turn of fortune's wheel may give him back his throne greece was a kingdom for almost one hundred years it won its independence from turkey about the time andrew jackson was serving his first term as president of the united states the first king was chosen through the guarantee of the three then greatest powers great britain france and russia and the man selected was otto the second son of the king of batavia he came to the throne at the age of eighteen and reigned for twenty-nine years before he was expelled by the people that was when abraham lincoln was president and we were in the midst of the civil war then the three powers made another selection and guaranteed the throne to a son of the royal family of denmark which had long been breeding kings and queens for europe the man chosen was george the first the second son of the king of denmark and he reigned over greece for more than fifty years he was on the throne when i first visited athens and i then had an interview with him in the royal palace to which i refer farther on in this chapter i met him again here twenty years later not long before he was assassinated at salonica king george i was succeeded by his son constantino who reigned from nineteen thirteen to nineteen seventeen when he was deposed and his second son alexandros was chosen about three years later alexandros died and constantino was taken back only to be expelled again in nineteen twenty two constantino went to switzerland where he soon died and george the second ascended the throne it was during his brief rule that i talked with him here in athens my interviews with king george the first took place in the old palace on constitution square it is now occupied by the officials of the near east relief the american organization of which i hear nothing but praise in my travels in this part of the world my audience with king george the second was in a new building erected in the old palace grounds just in the rear of the former home of the king it is an unostentatious but beautiful stone structure surrounded by a great park although it is right in the heart of the city soldiers in the ballet skirts of the ancient greek uniform stood at the gate and saluted as we went by entering we came into a hall that would not be considered magnificent in any millionaire's house in the states a servant clad in a modest uniform took our hats and hung them up on a rack near the entrance we walked alone up the white marble stairs to the main floor and waited in a home-like parlor which had none of the stiffness of the usual waiting rooms of royalty the palace has perhaps forty rooms it is simply furnished the paintings are modern and some of the decorations would not be out of place in the country home of a well-to-do american for instance i noticed a center table covered with an indian cotton cloth such as might be bought for two dollars in any department store the chairs had on summer suits of blue gingham and the walls were calcimined in light blue a very ordinary electric chandelier hung from the ceiling george the second is simple in his tastes and always preferred his country home known as tatoy situated about twenty-five miles from athens the palace in the city is the property of the nation but the estate of tatoy was bought by king george the first this young man's grandfather and was run as a farm as well as a royal place of residence tatoy has excellent soil and george the first had large vineyards from which he made wine 
but found a ready market in athens the estate is not far from marathon where the invading persians were defeated by the athenians in 490 b c there is a fairly good motor road from there to athens over which i understand alexandros who was king from 1917 to 1920 could make the trip to his palace here in 25 minutes king alexandros was famous as a motorist while a prince he was honorary president of the chauffeurs union in paris and later was wont to drive down university street in athens at fifty miles an hour he was democratic in his tastes and considered the king job a kind of amusement you may remember that he died of blood poisoning caused by the bite of his pet monkey but to return to the palace i had waited but a short time when the high court chamberlain a plainly dressed man appeared and asked me to come with him we walked together across the hall and entered the library where at a desk with photographs of his father mother and grandfather facing him sat a young man of thirty-two it was his majesty george the second king of greece he rose as i entered the high court chamberlain introduced me and his majesty gave me a cordial shake of the hand motioning me to a seat at his side the presentation was about the same as that one would have to any business man and the dress of the king struck the same note of simplicity he wore a business suit of scotch tweed and his soft white collar was held tight to a black knit silk foreign hand tie by a gold pin i have a pin much like it that cost me three dollars his shoes were of tan and his only jewelry consisted of two rings on the fingers of his left hand one of these was a gold wedding ring as we talked i had a good chance to study the king his appearance was pleasing i saw a well set up healthy young man about five feet eight inches tall his features were strong his hair was dark and his eyes were as blue as the skies over his palace he was cordial in his greeting and smiled as he talked he had no mannerisms whatsoever and he impressed me as being modest and forceful our conversation was in english and his majesty spoke without reserve among the subjects discussed were the difficulties of greece in looking after the million odd refugees forced out of smyrna and other parts of the old turkish empire king george said he wanted to thank the united states for its aid in their care he said greece could eventually absorb all its refugees and that their young blood would add much to the strength of the nation i asked him about farming conditions he replied that the crops of greece could be greatly increased by intensive cultivation and more irrigation the climate and the soil of this country he said are much like those of california he referred to what the naval orange has done for southern california saying that the greeks had recently imported cuttings of that tree and were going to try them out in different parts of the country in the course of our conversation i said your majesty may i ask a personal question what is that he said i should like to have your majesty tell me frankly how you like your job a look of disgust came over the face of the young monarch as he replied i loathe it i hate it i despise it i would like to be free from it but how can i help it it would not be hard perhaps to find someone who would change places with you said i let him come forth and i will give him the chance said the king how about yourself i will give you my job and take yours which seems to me much more interesting it was shortly after this that the king lost his job and departed from athens almost in tears when i read the news i was glad i still held my job king george married elizabeth the eldest daughter of queen marie and king ferdinand of roumania it was a love match the two met in switzerland when he had no hope of ever becoming king they fell in love george popped the question and elizabeth said yes their marriage was simple and their wedded life now is as domestic and retired as that of our grandmothers and grandfathers in the days of the puritans they love each other and there has never been a breath of scandal connected with either i don't know how much money george the second was able to lay by while he was king but his grandfather george the first was rich greece gave him two hundred and seventy thousand dollars a year and in addition russia great britain and france each paid him twenty thousand annually from a royal standpoint living in greece was not expensive and george the first 
who was an investor and a speculator should have laid up a fortune in the fifty years of his reign i met king george the first when he was in his prime he was the most democratic of monarchs and this seems to have been a characteristic of the whole royal family king george and queen olga she was you know a niece of alexander the second emperor of russia were fond of strolling about athens and stopping on the streets to chat with their friends they liked the americans and many of our prominent citizens were entertained at their family table the king was accustomed to take trips through the country and talk with the farmers on such occasions he wore no sign of his rank and had no trouble in getting opinions for every greek peasant has decided views as to how not only athens but the whole world should be run greece was never a monarchy in the arbitrary or tyrannical sense of the word its kings were mere figureheads and the people have ruled to a great extent the greek republics of ancient times were usually cities with a few dozen square miles of territory about them the vote was limited to the free citizens and these were so few that they could all be addressed in the open air the republics of that time had no civil service and there were no organized political parties there was more graft than there is now and to take a bribe was hardly considered disgraceful athens was full of demagogues and most of them were willing to sell their souls for votes politics in greece today are far less corrupt than they used to be the country is now ruled as it has been ever since it threw off the yoke of turkey by the national parliament called the boule this consists of but one chamber to which members are elected by popular vote for the term of four years the constitution also provides for a council of state which is something like our senate though it has much less power the boule has three hundred and sixty-nine members divided just now among five parties they get only eight hundred dollars a year and are fined if they are absent for more than five sittings a month all greece is divided into departments each of which is under a governor appointed by the ministry of athens and sends representatives to the national assembly on election days each candidate has his own ballot box with his photograph on top and he can be present and watch the proceedings if he wishes all citizens whose names are on the voting list are handed as many buckshot as there are places to be filled the ballot boxes are divided into two compartments a white one labeled yes and a black one marked no the voter thrusts his arm through a hole in the top so that no one can tell into which compartment he finally drops his shot wives of candidates often help their husbands in the campaign and i have heard of one woman who won the vote of a whole village by distributing free tickets for a trip to athens the opening of parliament is a great social event the ministers attend in full evening dress and the dignitaries of the orthodox church are present in their black robes and high hats after the preliminaries are over the premier and the archbishop go to a table in the center of the hall on which is a gold vessel filled with holy water the archbishop holds out a cross which the premier kisses the archbishop dips an olive sprig in the water and strikes the premier on the brow with it the other ministers of state go through the same ceremony the sessions of the greek parliament are often lively affairs especially in the last few years when the country has had so many ups and downs with rapid changes of governments and kings violent speeches are not uncommon and sometimes lead to disorder within the chamber itself they may even result in members meeting outside to fight duels End of chapter 24